coming to you from the Star City. This is Scarlet Fever, a daily Nebraskan production. Well, I hope you enjoyed your college football Saturday a little bit better than some other people did. Welcome into Scarlet Fever. Glad to have you back. Went on a little mini vacation. Nebraska went on fall break, and clearly the football team also was thinking fall break, Mm -hmm. as it is a... Normally we have football Mondays. We did not have football Monday this week because of fall break, so we're doing it today. You'll get your full thrill of football here on Football Wednesday. Danny Burke's here. Ben Droz is here. Yep. Nice to see you, Ben. Nice to see you too, Danny. I think the fall break was nice because if I would have had to talk about this game on a Monday, oh, that I'd probably be that a lot. That would have been awful. Um, there would have probably been like, – like I don't – like I am not as attached emotionally to this team as a lot of people. I mean I, I really try to be like – in the middle and think about it rationally like i don't usually let my emotions at all affect my judgment of this team they would have if i would have talked about it on monday so i think it's a blessing in disguise that we're talking about it on a wednesday it's kind of nice i'm you know it's been how many days four three or four days no about yeah yeah four days since um the massacre that occurred on saturday so um yeah, let's just, let's just get right into let's it. You want to start? It. Let's start with my position grades because last week, no, before, two weeks before, ago, we, weeks. before we get there, um, we are got our record day October twenty third, twenty twenty four. Thank you for listening. It is a Wednesday. Uh, it is a Wednesday. Uh, Spotify or Apple. We got YouTube finally going again. Woo! Glad to have you guys all back. You can see Ben's wonderful T shirt. Hey, um, he looks great today. The hair's <laughs> going. The hair's doing it. But yeah, let's let's, let's let's just jump right into this and you know nor- normally ben i don't really i hate using obscenities but Whoa. wtf Duh. like <laughs> what was that as ben breaks down <laughs> i just gotta start with what was that and i would say a lot less words if it wouldn't get me uh, pulled um, I, that, that's really all i can say and just like ben i am not as emotionally attached to this as some other people are and that's fine but that should not be happening when you're coming out of a bye week. That is that that that's not even that's not even it doesn't even go into ridiculous category. It, it is disgraceful and it's embarrassing. That's really um, all I got for that. The the word I was looking for was um I mean it it was it was I mean this might be harsh but it was a pathetic performance. I mean it was oh, pathetic. Yeah. There was there was Oh yeah. There, I mean I mean there was not a single positive thing to take away from that game. I mean really. I mean Fedoni played Good. He had a career day. I, I mean, that that's I guess one positive is they finally got Fedoni going. Um, but other than that, there I mean, there just really wasn't anything. Um, there was nothing. MJ good. Sherman played pretty good. He he was like the only defensive player that had like a, according to the PFF grades, that actually had a good day. He was the only one. Um, everyone else on defense didn't get too good of grades. Um, according to PFF, which I agree with in this certain this, in this, in this instance, circuit, and normally yes. that doesn't happen. No, I usually don't like their grades. I usually don't care about their grades at all. But <laughs> I was in, I was intrigued, and I mean, I thought I aligned pretty well with how the game went. Yeah, you ask what happened, and no one expected this coming out of a bye week. Both teams came out of a bye week, and that just shows. Let's just come right out, come go, right out with go it. Go for it. Go for it. Th- this, th- there was no talent gap between these teams. I, I still believe that. Indiana is not a much more talented team than Nebraska. They might be barely a little bit more talented, but even then, I, I don't know. I think this, the, these two teams are just as talented as each other. I, I really, truly believe that. So when it comes to that, well, it's like, okay, they're both very similar talented teams. You then go to coaches. So you go to coaches and how the players executed. Indiana has a lot. I, I said this coming into the game. Indiana has a lot of continuity between their between their players. Very experienced team. Um, Signetti brought a lot of people over from James Madison. They all know each other. I mean, it was it unexpected that Nebraska lost. No, no. It's it's the way they lost. I mean, and the the comment after the game that was most intriguing to me was when Matt Rule said that the team didn't quit. Um, I'm gonna call. Um. I don't want to say that he was lying because I think he truly does believe that. But if you were an outsider watching that game, the the, the team quit. I mean, you you don't lose fifty six to seven if the team didn't quit. I mean, the game was. I mean, with like four minutes left in the second in the I mean, four minutes left in the first half, it was a fourteen to seven game. 
Nebraska was only down by one score. I mean, they were right. I mean, it was just like, you know, you felt like this was going to, you know, be a close game. Indiana, I mean, you could tell Indiana was playing better, but Nebraska was still right there. And then it just all fell apart. It all fell apart. And I and, and Matt Rule even said this on Monday, the stain of the Scott Frost era of here we go again is still with this team. It's still with this team. And that is why it snowballed so bad. That is why it was 56-7. to seven. Is Indiana 56-7 to seven better than Nebraska? No. Not on any planet are they be- that much better than Nebraska. This was just Nebraska getting in their own way. This was... Um, Dowdell fumbles it on fourth down when they would have got a first down, but he fumbles it. Oh my gosh, something bad happened. Ja'Cory Barney on a kickoff catches it, goes out of bounds at the one-yard line. Again, another bad thing happens. The team is all thinking, here we go again. The defense gives up a couple of big plays. The defense is thinking, here we go here we again. Go, yeah. I mean, that, that's just, that was the whole mindset of the team after all those bad plays. And the bad plays, just, it just kept happening. It kept happening. And it, it, it just snowballed. And the team knew, like, you could tell, you could tell when the team knew that they weren't going to win. Like, you could tell when Nebraska players knew that this, that this game wasn't winnable. And that's when it really started to collapse in that second half. Because in that first half, I mean, Indiana, I mean, Nebraska did not play good in that first half. But they were right there. I mean, for a large part of that first half, they were right there with Indiana. But then that second, I mean, the end of the end of the first half, and then that entire second half was just ugly. It was just ugly football. Like, it was really hard to watch. And I forced myself to watch it because I cover the team, and I felt like I had I felt like I had to. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, there's just nothing positive to take away from this game. And you got people, I mean, now I want to take a step back. Nebraska is 5-2 and two right now. They're 5-2. and two. I mean, if you would have, I mean, at this point in the season, if you would have said Nebraska's 5-2, and two, I don't think Husker fans would have been too mad about that. Heading in Ohio State, you're five and two. I, I don't. I really don't think Husker fans would have been that mad. They would have maybe been a little bit, dis, little bit disappointed. They would maybe would have won six and one, or a lot of fans thought seven and zero was feasible, and seven and zero was feasible. It was attainable. Was it likely? No, but it was doable. But six and one was and five and two were kind of the two likely outcomes, and it's five and two. And you would think at five and two, the rhetoric wouldn't be the sky is falling. Because, because I mean, if you look at Husker Twitter or Hus, I mean, anything with Husker fans, it it seems like the sky is falling. We, we also got to remember too, and I'm glad you brought that up. We've got to remember too that Nebraska fans are some of the of the most short tempered people, especially on social media. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I it, mean, I can be that way too. And and I mean, I with this football team, my my mantra ever since I've been watching this team, covering this team. I've always had kind of a pessimistic outlook on this team. And I come, like, you know, a lot of Husker fans are optimistic. They always, they're always optimistic heading into the season. Now, I was more optimistic this year than years past just because of the schedule and getting Rayola here and all that. But I still had a pessimistic outlook on, okay, no, Nebraska's probably not going to be 7 0. Why do I always have that pessimistic outlook? Because they haven't, Nebraska as a football team has not shown me anything in my entire lifetime for why I shouldn't be pessimistic. When, have, when has Nebraska ever done something that you, like you give them the benefit of the doubt and they go and prove you right? Ben, I remember um, during the winter months and in the early spring, we were having a discussion about what we thought Nebraska could do this fall. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling you that my expectations, with all things considered, the schedule, the transfers, Mm -hmm. the new people coming in, Mm -hmm. I had said that, and I still stand by it, and I feel like I'm getting proven right, that I can't have big expectations until they prove it. And I, I remember, and I and I don't mean to call you out, but I do remember you saying, like, okay, but this makes a lot of sense. Like, bowl game makes a lot of sense here. And I still think that bowl game is still feasible. It's with, still with, easily without, feasible. Without a doubt. They're on the doorstep of bowl eligibility, and I don't think that people should be like, okay, sky is falling. They are not making the playoffs. Five and seven is totally happening. Like, no, come on, slow down. 
Like this is. It, I mean, but but the thing is, it could happen. We, yes, it, it could happen, <laughs> but we get, we're not there yet. We're not. No. We're, we are seven games into the season. There are still five games left. You only got to win one of them to make bowl eligibility. Mm-hmm. And we we also got to remember that. But I think that Nebraska fans setting expectations for this team when they didn't deserve them was a little short sighted. I mean, because we got hold on. We got to no, we got to remember that this is a team that has stumbled and bumbled since <laughs> 2016. Yeah, 20, 2016. That was eight years ago. Yeah, I, I was in what junior high? <laughs> I was in what sixth grade? I think. Yeah, I think I was in junior high. I wasn't. I mean, I was. Spoiler alert. I wasn't a Nebraska fan. Didn't even know Nebraska existed. I, I, I know it's hard for you to believe, but I was shorter then than I am right now. <laughs> so I wasn't. I don't. To be fully transparent, I am not in the Nebraska lore that a lot of people are that will listen to the show and live here in Lincoln or wherever they're listening in the state. Mm-hmm. But I do know this: the futility of this team still has not left, and even though they're five and two, I mean. I can't say that I have felt good about a game all year since UTEP. Even Colorado, I had some reservations, particularly about that second half play. You and I scared me with that defense. Yeah, they only gave up three points, but you and I was doing whatever they wanted, and they kicked themselves in the foot whenever they got close to scoring. And then it kind of, it's felt like it's been a slow progression down since then, especially on the offensive side of the ball. They're not – see, this this is the outlook I, I don't like. People saying that they're regressing. I don't think they're regressing. I think they're just playing better teams, and Nebraska's just not there yet. That, that I, That's where it is. Like, I don't think Nebraska is a worse team right now than they were at the beginning of the year. Some people really believe that. Mm. I, I, I don't think Nebraska is a worse team right now. Now, is not playing as good. One, that's competition. Two, I think – I mean, I think he's a little banged up. You saw he hurt his ankle in that – what was that, the – Illinois game? Yeah, was, he, did, he was it, a little gimpy. Illinois game. He, he's been dealing with an injury, I'm pretty sure. Who hasn't said anything. He's been getting up to play. He's not going to. But, I mean, I, I truly believe he is not 100%. And, I mean, Nebraska's just played better competition they, now. Yeah. They, I but, mean, when you, you go to it. I mean, when they played Colorado, Colorado was just not a good team right, right then when they played them. And then same thing. I mean, Purdue just isn't a good team. Rutgers, they're just not. I mean, all these games My, that they won, they're just not good. And just because Nebraska lost against a team that's better than those teams doesn't mean that they're regressing. That I'm not. Just, I'm not saying that they're regressing. I'm some say- people are though. Oh, I'm not saying that they're regressing at all. I think this is the same team from the start of the season. But now that they're playing better teams, they're getting exposed. Yes, they're clearly. clearly. Uh, they're absolutely getting exposed. Like yes. This this is you can't be run. They're not running over teams like they were at the start of the season because those teams Weren't were good. so far worse than they are. But we got to remember that they have not played like a str- like five five and two is so misleading if you haven't actually looked at the performances and you haven't actually sat and watched the performances. I mean, I, I don't think I don't think five and two is misleading. I um, I don't think that they deserve the five and two record right now. I don't think that they deserve to be on the doorstep of it now, just because of how they played over the last month. Now, if Nebraska was in the SEC, this would be a completely different conversation. Different conversation, but they're in the Big Ten, and the Big Ten is a great conference, the second best conference in college football. But still, it's not the SEC. And you look at st- strength of schedule. Nebraska just, I mean. I mean, the, the, it's not. Mis- I mean, the five and two is a little misleading. If you, I mean, you can't judge teams just off the record, and I think that's kind of what you're getting at here. You can't be like, oh, Nebraska's five and two; they must be really good. But then you look at some of the SEC teams, and they might only have three or four wins. But I mean, you look at the teams they play, and it's just ridiculous. Um, I mean, the, I mean, have you seen Florida's schedule? Oh, that schedule is crazy. I, I, I'm I mean, pull- even, I, even yeah. from the start of the season. They they had a gauntlet all season long, but I, I totally get what you're saying. And I think for this season, even though that the Big Ten teams aren't playing SEC teams, I think the that the 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 two conferences are a little bit closer in competition this year than they u- usually are. Yes. Especially towards the top. I'm not saying that the Big Ten is better, but I think when you stack the 
three or four best Big Ten teams against the three or four best SEC teams. I think you could see no, it, it's, you, it's you could see some similarities there. It's sim- I, I'm talking about depth though. I'm oh, talking depth about SEC has well, it completely. So th- this is the thing is that SEC teams don't have games like Purdue, and they don't have games like I mean Vanderbilt has been. So the, they, they, they've been the donkey of the SEC they, for decades, and now they're ranked. This is this is what I'm saying. I mean, okay, and it's real quick. Florida, so Nebraska's five and two. Florida's four and three. So if you look at records, you'd be like, oh, Nebraska's better, right? Florida has played Miami, Sanford. Rank, yeah, rank. Sanford. Don't I mean no. that, that was a gimme, but Texas, a, Texas A&M ranked now. Mississippi State. Yeah. UCF, decent Big decent. Twelve team. Tennessee ranked, and then they played Kentucky, who played Georgia really tough. Kentucky should is, should be and getting the, more respect than they're getting. And then now you want to know who they play upcoming? <laughs> they play Georgia. Oh. They play Texas. Oh. They play LSU. Oh. They play Ole Miss. Oh my god! Well, yeah, Ole and, Miss. Yeah. And then they play Florida State. And now Florida. Oh. Yeah, but I'm just saying. Imagine if Nebraska had a three week had a sorry had a five, four. had a five week stretch where they played Tennessee, Kentucky. Georgia, Texas, LSU. They'd lose all five games. Newsflash. This, this is what I'm saying. So, th- this this is. I mean, I'm, I'm going on a little bit of a soapbox. This, this is the worst. This is the worst part of college football is the scheduling. It, it's so like, it's so just not. It's. I don't want to say it's not fair, but it's so like you can't judge Matt Rule in Nebraska's season the same way you judge Florida's. I mean, you, you just can't. How How is Florida supposed to get as many wins as Nebraska this year with that schedule with the Nebraska schedule? Nebraska plays Ohio State. They played Indiana. But other than that, they don't really play a team that's just like this all-great team. They just really don't. And, and Florida has Tennessee, Georgia, Texas, LSU. I mean, and Miami. On their schedule. I mean, it's just like the the discrepancy is just, it's crazy to me. If Nebraska had that schedule, Husker fans would be livid. They'd be livid. Nebraska would probably win three or four games. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Now, Nebraska's in the Big Ten. That's not their schedule. So, I mean, I'm going to talk with reality, but that was just a little bit of a soapbox. I just, I don't like how some teams have just such a daunting schedule that just seems impossible to navigate. And then you have teams like, I mean, I'm just going to say it, Nebraska, who just really doesn't have that tough of a schedule. All of the games are pretty gettable. So, but anyways, let's get into this. I mean, Nebraska, we haven't really talked specifically about the game. What what went wrong? Now, we say everything, but what specifically stood out? The biggest problem this year has been Nebraska has not been able to run the ball, and that continued against Indiana. Nebraska, as a team, as you put it, Nebraska, as a team, cannot run the ball. It's really bad. They ran the ball 29 times, and they only got 70 yards. That's an average of 2.4 yards a, yards a carry. That is not. It's just. It's not good enough. Now, the, I, I I haven't said I I haven't been wanting to say this, but I'm now going to say it after the Indiana game. Nebraska has one of the worst rushing attacks in the Big Ten. They do. They're not as bad as UCLA. Like if you look at UCLA has only gotten like 600 rushing yards this year. And UCLA <laughs> UCLA's offense has, yeah. has looked better lately. UCLA is averaging 60 rushing yards a game. So, they're not their rushing attack isn't that porous, but Nebraska has one of the worst rushing attacks in the Big 10 and it's pretty easy to say that. And that's holding this entire offense back. You have Running backs that, I mean, I'm just going to be frank with you, they're not bad running backs, but they're just not good enough to overcome iffy offensive line play. And that's and it, it the, hasn't and, been strong all year. No, and that's the problem. Now, if you look, I mean, we talked about beginning, coming into the year, where like Rayola has enough around him. That was when we were seeing them against not as good competition. We're now seeing them against teams like Illinois, teams like Indiana. And we're seeing Nebraska still, while it's improved from last year, the skill talent on this team is still not very high. I'm just going to put it that way. They have some pieces. Ja'Cory Barney is a very good player, but he's only a freshman. Carter Nelson hasn't gotten that much action, but I think he has a lot of potential and a lot of talent. But you got guys like Nayer and Banks, who are these big wide receivers on the outside, that, I mean, 
that can't that can't get off the line. They can't get off. Their teams are just pressing Nebraska. Teams know how to stop this offense now. It's it's on film. It's on film, and you and all you have to do is not play zone against this team. When you play zone against Nebraska, they're gonna find the short routes underneath. And they're going to find open space. If you just man Nebraska's skill skill positions up, minus Fedoni, because Fedoni's actually shown that he can create some space. But I'm talking about against Nebraska's wide receivers, they can't get open. They can't get open when they're manned up. And part of that, I have, I, I think, is is coaching. The coaching for the wide receivers is, I I, I have to think, is just not that great because I think these wide receivers have talent. They're just not showing it. And two, even though they do have some talent, it's still not as good a talent as all these other teams' secondaries. Like Indiana and Illinois' secondaries were just better than Nebraska's wide receivers. They were just better. Nebraska's wide receivers just couldn't get open. You see Rayola going through his progressions, and he just doesn't have anyone to throw it to. He just has no one to throw it to. I like I'm gonna pose you a question. Is the bet besides Rayola, is the best part of this offense the wide receivers? No. Is it the running backs? No. No. You might want to say it's the tight ends with Fedoni. But I want to say the best part of this offense might be the offensive line. And that is saying something because the offensive line has been very average this year. It's been very average. They've been pretty good pass blocking. Pass blocking has not been bad. Not They're not good run blocking. This hasn't been a good run blocking offensive line. Which which explains why Royal is taking 45 throws a game. And this is another thing, and, and and I think this goes back to, now, still, I think that this offense has more talent than it did last year. Now, the offense wasn't great last year, but Nebraska had, like, the second-best rushing attack in the Big Ten last year. What's different this year? You don't have a running quarterback. Now, I think your quarterback's better this year, but you don't have a running quarterback. Rayola is he's no— not, he's, he's not as mobile. He's no—like, not even— He's not as good of a runner as Harburg, but he has the potential to do it. He's just not doing it. They're not running him at all. And I think part of it has to do with his injury I think he's dealing with. And also, they just don't want him to get hurt. If you go they're, they're out trying there— to, They're trying to protect they're trying the to protect Rayola. So, it, so their quarterback is no threat to run, and that's really affecting the run game. Because, I mean, that's the only thing that's changed. Is the backfield less talented than it was last year? No. Last year, they had— Anthony Grant and they had Gabe Emma Irvin jo- and Emma and Emma, Johnson. I mean Emma, Emma Johnson and Gabe Irvin who got hurt early in the season, but still, it's basically the same. All you did was change Dante Dowdell with, um, you change Anthony Grant with Dante Dowdell. That's all you did, and Dowdell yeah. might be a better running back than Grant, but he hasn't really shown it yet. But this is what. So the only thing that's changed is you don't have a running quarterback right now. Now the passing game is better, but it's not good enough right now to overcome the I mean just the bad rushing game. They, I mean Nebraska just has n- nothing going with it with the running game. Now Rule said and Satterfield also said that they just need to commit to it more. I don't think I I don't think like whether you run the ball 10 times or you run it 30 times, you're still only averaging 2.4 yards a carry. I mean, no, what, no matter how you slice, it doesn't matter if you run it 30 times or 10 times, right? Nope. I mean, you're, you're still mm-hmm. averaging the same amount of yards. Something has to change for this running game to get a spark. Now, that either needs to be A, getting Rayola to run a little bit more. I'm not saying they have to have him run eight times a game. I'm just saying, like, three times maybe. And, and not even that. I mean, just a design run play, like, two or three times in a game. And then have him scramble a little bit out of the pocket. Now, I don't know if the coaches are telling him to not scramble or if he just doesn't want to scramble, but he's, he's, Rayola is athletic enough to be able to, I mean, you see him making guys miss in the pocket. I mean, his footwork and agility and athleticism is good enough to be an okay running quarterback. He's not Harburg running the football, but he's still good. He's still good enough to do it. I mean, it's not Tanner Lee back there. So they either need to A, run Rayola more. Or B, Harburg's got to get some more touches. Instead of I can't believe we're saying that. Instead of having Harburg going to get the ball two or three times a game, have him get the ball eight to ten times a game. 
I mean, I, we're at this point. At ben, the beginning ben, of the ben, at the beginning of the season, I was completely against it. I completely. Are you, I, I ad, are you advocating for Heinrich Harburg to pretty much join the running back room? No, I'm advocating that Rayola comes out a little bit, and Harburg comes in on some special packages. That that's what I'm saying. Either one of the two needs to happen. I think the more realistic thing is that Rayola just runs it a little bit more. I mean, that's the easiest, simplest fix. But I don't think they're going to do that because they don't want him to get hurt, and he's already dealing with an injury. So you then turn to Harburg, and I'm not. I mean, let's just say this: if take away Rayola, if it was, I don't know. Let's say Casey Thompson was starting quarterback right now for Nebraska. With how the offense has looked, would people be saying we need to bench Casey Thompson and get Harburg in there? Would people be saying that? I'd sure hope not. But I, feel I, like- I think people would be saying. I think people, some people would be calling for a quarterback change right now. Now Nebraska mm. has Rayola. I'm not saying they should bench him. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I'm saying right now is that the only reason no one's talking about it at all is because it's Rayola and he has a lot of talent. And you don't want to take him off the field, but something is—it's n- not working. It's just not. You got to do something to spark the running game. Now, I think that's bringing Harburg in on some special packages. Sometimes, like send Harburg out there, and you know, okay, we're gonna run three plays with Harburg in a row, and then Rayola gets back out there. Something like I'm not saying Harburg should be the quarterback the entire drive or whatever. I'm saying like. Two or three plays, you just have Harburg out there, and you just run and and, and you just run some run game, run plays or something. The run the running game needs something. Nebraska is not going to beat. I mean, they're not going to probably beat Ohio State either way. But you have no shot of being Ohio State if you're averaging two point four yards a carry. You're not going to beat Wisconsin or Iowa only averaging two point four yards a carry. You're probably not going to beat USC doing that. I mean, the only game, if Nebraska keeps playing like this, the only game that's really gettable right now is UCLA. And even that one is a lot less less gettable than it was before the bye week. And also, UCLA is going to be coming off the back of what's probably going to be two beatdowns against Indiana and then Ohio State coming up. So you got to know that confidence, whether the coaches say confidence is not an issue, I, I, I don't want to get into that. But you can't say that the confidence is going to be high going into that game after two games where you're probably going to get blown out in a row. No. They, and you're telling me that that's the most gettable game after two games in a row where you're going to have just a very lopsided score? This is what I'm saying. Remember when we talked at the beginning of the year that the red flags were starting to go up the pole? I think we're at the top. They're almost at the top right now. Like They are almost at the top. Like It is like one more pull down on the string and the flags at the top of the pole. I'm not wanting to say it's there yet because Nebraska is still 5-2. and two. They're still 5-2. and two. Nebraska could still win three more games this year, get to eight wins, and everybody's happy. Now, is that the outcome that's going to happen? I would say uh, no. If I was a, if I was probably a betting not. man, if I, if, if I was a betting man. And you're a bad better. I'm not a betting man. But if I was a betting man, I would say Nebraska probably does win one more this year. But it's really hard to say that Nebraska's going to win any more than that with the way things are going right now. Something's going to have to change. And and the defense just is what it is right now. We haven't talked about the defense. That's not the story, though, this week. I mean, they gave up 56 points. I mean, they didn't play well. And, and the conversation, I mean, we debated it on this show. The conversation, is this a great defense? I, I don't want to hear it anymore. This is not an elite defense. This is a good defense. It is not an elite defense. And I'm not wanting to take a shot at Emma, who's not here today. <laughs> but she was really trying to push that this is an elite defense. And I just, and I said, we haven't seen them do it against a good offense. And once again, Nebraska played lo, a good lo offense. Lo and behold. They played another group. They played a good offense. And they got exposed. Now, this de- now the re- Ohio after Ohio State, this defense should be able to play good against every team left on this schedule. Maybe USC gives Nebraska's defense a little bit of trouble, but I don't think so. Nebraska's defense should be good the rest of the way. They're, I mean, they're not giving up 56 points again after Ohio State. They shouldn't. They're, they're not going to. So, this is why I'm not really—like, the defense just is what it is right now. I mean, 
you can't I mean there's not really any changes that Tony White can do to all of a sudden turn a switch on this defense. I mean it just is what it is. They're going to get better each and every week, but the defense just I mean these are the players you got. The offense is what needs a spark. The offense is what you can do something to give it a spark and really turn around how things go. I mean, I'm not at all calling for Marcus Satterfield to get fired at all. But you look at what Purdue did. They fired their offensive coordinator. What happened the very next week? They scored, what, 49 points against Illinois? And they tried to steal the game from them on a two-point conversion in overtime. A team that beat Nebraska in overtime. I'm just saying sparks can happen. I'm not saying the spark has to happen by firing someone. I'm saying the spark needs to happen with the way plays are being called, the personnel being put out there, and then third, I mean, who is making the play calling? Those are the three things you can change. The play calls you're doing, the players that are out there, and the person making the play calls. Ben, let me ask you this. This I've talked a lot, so I'll let you go a little bit, Danny. Oh no! I'm gonna let you talk some more because oh, I, I th- thank you. I think you'll have some. I think you'll have some good insight on this. About the, I'll ask you two questions, but I'll ask you this Uh-oh. first: two Marcus questions. Marcus Satterfield, after a season and a half, is this working with Marcus Satterfield as the offensive coordinator? Um, I, I <laughs> um, I think the I, answer b- before 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 I let you answer that. I am also in no way calling for Marcus Satterfield's job, but I think at this point, what we're what nineteen games into his tenure, something like that, something Nin- like that, yeah. about about nineteen. I think this is a point. We have reached a point to where we should be evaluating. I, I mean, we evaluate every week, but I think this we have gotten to a point to where we need to take a harder look at this because yeah. we have and. I'll gladly let you go on your rants again, but we have my biggest gripe with. I like that word. My my big thank you. My biggest gripe with Satterfield, <laughs> and some of it might have come from Rule as well, but my biggest problem, and maybe a little bit of Glenn Thomas. So there's there's a bunch of people here, is taking the ball away from your best offensive player on the field. I have had a big issue with that. Who do you think that is, Danny? Who's the best offensive player on this? Team? It's Rayola. I I, think, I mean he has the ball every time, but they're you know they're they're not letting him use his full skill set. That that's what I, I think. Are, we, are you talking about running, or are you talking about just like what? what I think specifically. I'm talking about just his total package, all the things he can do. Letting him go and air the ball out. Let him you know find the screen passes that he thinks that are. You know, he, he doesn't need to be I I mean maybe this isn't happening as much as I think it is. But we shouldn't there there should not be balls that are, you know, feel like they're backwards passes. He should be running the ball. He's clearly a mobile guy. Yeah. I feel not like, not not Harbor. I, I feel like he, he's not Harbor, but he's a mobile enough quarterback yeah. to where he can make plays with his legs when he needs to. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that the coaching staff has been overly uber protective with Royola, and understandably so. This is only we got to remember that he is a freshman. He's only played seven games in college, but he's also miles away from where other freshman quarterbacks usually are with his skill set and his experience. No, I agree. So I'll, I'll ask you again. I want to go back to Satterfield. 19 games in, what do we think of him? Because personally, and again, I'm not calling for his job, but I think his seat is starting to warm up a little bit. No, it's it's definitely warmer today than it was heading into the Indiana game. There's no there's no denying that. I mean, even a someone who just is absolutely in love with Mark, Mark and Satterfield and does. I'm sorry to stop you, but I also no, want to good. make this point. Between Tony White and Marcus Satterfield, I'm more upset at Marcus Satterfield. Oh, yeah, 100%. I, I am more upset with Marcus Satterfield no. than Tony White. I it, think that that Tony White has got his guys in order. They know what they're doing every week. They know yes. what what their goals are set out to be. And it's evident with just the way 
Tony White presents himself and his players when they go and they speak to people. Yes. It's very different than on the offensive side of the ball. And even though Nebraska's defense gave up 56 points, I am not saying that Tony White's job needs to be gone. No. In, in, in no way. I think that Nebraska's defense just got outplayed by a good offense. They did. In, in, in this case. But for Nebraska's offense, they just looked incompetent. And I'll let you continue. No, you're good, Danny. So, um, real quick on Tony White before I get to Marcus Satterfield. I just think the defense, I mean, if I'm being honest, there's talent on the defense, but there is not an elite player on this defense. I think that's pretty safe to say. And I think that's kind of holding the defense back. They don't really have a guy that can go out there and just make plays on defense. They don't have that. Now, I think when it comes to Tony White, the conversations of is he going to be a head coach, I think those are going to start dying down. Yeah, turn that down a little bit. They're going to start dying down. He's still like very much a good defensive coordinator. I'm not. We're not saying he's not, but I'm just saying you have to first have an elite defense before you get people start thinking about having you as a head coach. So I think Tony White, the the question of is he going to be gone after this season to be a head coach. I think those are going to start dying down pretty soon. I don't think he's I think going to he'll be, still get some interviews. He'll still get, he'll some, still get interviews, some interviews, but I, I, I don't see him really. Land, if he does land a job, it's going to be at a very much lesser school, like yes. very much lesser school. But now on a Satterfield, because that that's this is the conversation that does need to be had because it it that was Marcus Satterfield's nineteenth game as the offensive coordinator and play caller for Nebraska, and last year it was. I mean, Nebraska doesn't have a quarterback that can throw it. They don't have wide receivers to throw it to. You kind of just gave Marcus Satterfield a lot of um, leeway with the way the offense is playing because there just wasn't a lot of talent on it. And it's understandable. He tried to make the yes. best with what he could. Now, there's more talent on the offense this year. It's still like like this offense still doesn't, doesn't have a guy like Trey Palmer. Because if this offense had a guy like Trey Palmer, this, would, this offense would look completely different. If they had yep. a guy that could stretch the field... This the running game would play better. Rayola would play better. The more wide receivers would be open because you'd have to be doubling Palmer all the time. I mean, just like they don't. That that's honestly the biggest problems with this offense right now, are that they can't run the ball and they can't stretch the field. Everything is like everything is just so congested. In 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 the from the line of scrimmage to the first down line, everything is just so congested. Nebraska just doesn't go downfield, which is very. Surprising to me because we just saw we saw Nebraska finally start going downfield against Northern Iowa. They 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 finally kind of started airing it out against Northern Iowa, and then also um, Rutgers, Rayola kind of aired it out a little bit sometimes. Even against Colorado, you kind of saw them open the playbook for him. It just seems like lately he just hasn't been asked to do that as much, and I. I don't think it's that Rayola is scared at all. That's not it at all. I think, I think the confidence and the trust in the wide receivers is waning with each week. It's waning with each each week. And that's pretty n- crazy to say, considering how we were talking about them to begin the season. I mean, yeah. I mean, Nair hasn't had a good game since the Illinois game. I when when was the last time we said good things about Jamal Banks? I mean, Jamal Banks had a good game against um, Purdue. Pretty sure. The last two games. Yeah. Had, oh, you're right. You're right. It, it Sorry, was my bad. It, no, you're good. Nayer hasn't had a good game since the Illinois game, and now that's been the surprising one. Yeah, Nayer's kind of been. He hasn't topped two catches since the, since that Illinois game. He's where he caught, faded out. He he caught two touchdowns in the Illinois. He's game. He's faded yeah. out. He's faded out. And Jamal Banks. He's still. I still think Jamal Banks is still the best wide receiver on this team. But I mean, he just showed that. He just wasn't. I mean, he just wasn't getting open against against Indiana. Now, I didn't go to to Indy to watch the game. I can't. So I'm just watching it on a TV. I can't see Jamal Banks on every play. That's the nice thing about being in the game, in actually at the game is you can see the going to the games over TV. You you can see the entire field, everything that's happening. On TV, you sometimes just can't see the receivers downfield. But, I mean, you just see Rayola, though, going through progressions and just not throwing it to guys. And that just means they're not open. They're, they're, He's they're taking just, a long time. They're, they're just not getting open. Now, Fedoni was getting open, but when Nair and Banks are manned up, they're just not getting open. 
And that is a huge problem on this offense. And that is causing an already porous run game to play even worse. Now, do I think Nebraska, like, should they be one of the worst rushing attacks in the Big Ten? No. I think this should, I mean, this should be an I get an average rushing team. In the they Big should Ten. be able to be competent running the ball. But Heinrich, the receiver, Heinrich Harburg should not be your leading rusher. No. And because Nebraska doesn't have a passing game with Jamal Banks and Nair right now, it's really hurting the run game. Now, after that Indiana game, I thought it was the run game making it so the passing game can't do anything. I'm kind of switching it around a little bit where I really think that because Nebraska just can't pass the ball, it's just really – like teams are just – they're just manning up and then loading the box. They're just putting their corner – they don't care if their corners are on an island. Indiana didn't care if they were their corners were one-on-one with Banks and Nair. They didn't care because they knew their corners were going to win that matchup. Nebraska can't say the same. Indiana was doing the same thing on offense. They were trying to get one-on-one with Nebraska's corner and their wide receiver, and their wide receivers were winning those battles. Nebraska's wide receivers were not winning the battles against Indiana's corners. I mean, that was really, I mean, that was honestly probably the difference in the game. Why didn't Indiana run the ball better? Because they had a passing game that made it so Nebraska couldn't just stack the box every time. I mean, Indi- I mean, it just looks like Nebraska- Nebraska's just running into Fort Knox. I mean, that's, I mean, that's really what it looks like. You already don't have a super talented backfield. You already have an offensive line that can't run block that good. And then you're adding on top of it, you, your passing game is just not, not – your wide receivers aren't getting open, so your passing game isn't great. And it's just, it's just such a dysfunctional offense right now. I mean, honestly, I'm not wanting to go backwards the last year. But at least – I mean, if you had to give me a choice, though, of, okay, do you, do you either want Nebraska to be able to run the ball or pass the ball? I want Nebraska to be able to run the ball. I mean, bottom line, if you can't run the ball in the Big Ten, you're going to lose. Now, Nebraska's offense was not good last year. It wasn't. But honestly, was the problem with the offense that they weren't moving the ball, or was the problem that they were just turning the ball over left and right? I think it was that they were turning the ball over left and I right. Would, I would I mean, agree. If, if, you, if Nebraska last year was turning the ball over as much as they were this year, which isn't very much, they did have a lot of turnovers against Indiana. But I'm saying overall this year, they have not turned the ball over that much. If they would have done that last year, the offense would have been looked at way better because they had had a running game. Even with the pieced together offense that they have, which was, it was very. They were starting Malachi Coleman, who's redshirting this year. Exactly. It It was not, it was not. A perfect offense. It was put together with the pieces that they had. No, but with, with really anyone that was healthy because they were so banged up. I mean, but I mean, if you and the quarter and the quarterback play just fed into it. But at least they could run the ball. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you, last year's Nebraska offense. Granted, the, t- the turnover woes. They the, the, last year's Nebraska offense would have moved the ball better against Indiana this year. Absolutely. Now, we don't want to go backwards. That's not what I'm saying. But what is the difference from this year to last year? They have a better wide receiver core. It's still not great, but it's better than it was last year. Your offensive line is probably a little bit better this year than it was last year. I think that's pretty safe to say. They're still not great. but they're st- Not by much, but yes. No, they're better this year than they were last year, despite injuries. The offensive line, honestly, is not. I mean, they're not great, but that's far from the issue on offense. Yeah. And your running back room is basically the same. The only thing that has changed is that you went from a running quarterback in Harburg to a passing quarterback in Rayola. Now, is Harburg better than Rayola? No. Mm -mm. But it's the way Nebraska is trying to run their offense is it's just not working against when their wide receivers when they go against a good secondary and their wide receivers just can't get separation. This offense is completely dysfunctional. It's completely dysfunctional. And how do you change that? You get a better rushing attack. And that still comes from either get Harburg the ball more, get some packages with him, or you got to start running Rayola a little bit. I mean, if you, I, I get you don't want Rayola to get hurt. And he's probably already a little banged up right now. But this is the mindset of playing to win or playing to not lose. Nebraska right now with Rayola, Rayola are playing to not lose. They're trying to not get him hurt. They're like, we want to protect Rayola at all costs. That is a mindset of trying to not lose. 
You have to have a mindset of trying to win. And I guarantee you, if you went to Rayola and be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get some packages with you, or we're gonna have like three or four designed quarterback run plays during the game, would Rayola say no? Absolutely not. No, he is a he's a team dude. He's a fierce competitor. Yes, wanting yes. to do everything that the team needs him to do. Now. You have his dad on the offensive line, Donovan Rayola, and you have to kind of start thinking, okay, you're thinking about the future. You don't want him to get hurt. You want to keep his dad happy and all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, why did Rayola come here? He came here to win games. Came here to win games. And how are you going to start winning games? Get the run game going. How do you get the run game going? You get your quarterback to finally be a little bit of a threat running the football because right now he's no threat no threat at all even indiana's quarterback i'll let you talk right after this point sorry danny no that's good even indiana's quarterback they weren't designing run plays for him but when he got pressured what did he do he stepped up in the pocket he got out of the pocket and he made some scrambles he scrambled a, no- a novel idea their quarterback oh, got pressured and he scrambled now he only got five or six yards you want to know what that makes the defense think? They have to think about it. This guy, this guy can can move a little the, bit. This guy actually is a threat to to squirt out of the pocket, get out of the pocket, and, and pick up some yardage. Now he wasn't out there getting twenty yard runs or whatever after he scrambled. But he was but able to make something out of nothing. Instead of having to throw the ball away and getting zero yards, he scrambled and got four to six yards. Now, if you're trying to keep your offense going at the right pace you're trying to get yardage each play having your quarterback be able to scramble a little bit and get some yardage helps you stay on track i mean i mean it could just be as simple as having rayola scramble a little bit more i mean it it could literally be that simple i mean you don't even have to go all out and have some designed quarterback run plays just get him to be even a little bit mobile even just just to take up take off upfield just a little bit sometimes because he can do it he could do it. He, it's not like he's Tanner Lee or like Tom Brady back there where he just is unathletic, can't make anybody miss in open space, none of that. That is not Rayola. Why was he being compared to Patrick Mahomes? Because he has he has a heck of an arm and he has really good feet, footwork. I mean, you see him missing guys in the pocket. He can make guys miss in space. He I mean, also looks just like Patrick Mahomes. He so. also looks exactly like him and wears the same <laughs> number. But still, I mean, not, all not of those things. Reason, Danny... I, I, that that's my take on this offense and what needs to happen. And I'll let you go. I still have more points, but I'll let you respond to what I've said so far. I think that for Nebraska, if they if they if they want to be anywhere near competitive, and this was a year where, I mean, every, every year for Nebraska football, everyone's thinking like, okay, hopes are high, but our feelings might get hurt. And the the problem with with Nebraska and especially the quarterback play and I want and I don't think this is Rayola's fault on his own I think I'm not the, blaming Rayola no no, no 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 what I'm saying is you need to be a dual threat quarterback to survive in the Big Ten you you have to be if you're going to, to play well and right now and I and I get that Rayola probably is not healthy and that's 100 fine. he's healthy enough to play but not 100 percent that's right. safe to say. That's right now. that's what I that's what I yes mean. yes. You have to be able to move. Mm-hmm. You cannot be immobile. You have to be able to move. You got to be able to scramble, even if that means just getting an extra, just getting a yard instead of throwing the ball away or taking the sack. Mm-hmm. It's recognizing that okay, this play is broken. I have to call my own number and make something happen. And I feel like. That and maybe this is incredibly far fetched, but from afar, it looks like because he has not gone out and tried to make a play on his own, either it's he's scared to, which I don't think it is, or it's been baked into his head by the coaches is that we don't want you running because we want to protect you, so don't do it. And I really hope it's not that second thing because that's a damnation on the coaching staff for not letting your players play. And and I hate to make references to professional football, especially when we're talking college ball. Completely different, yes. It's completely different. But I think there's, as, as most of you probably know, 
diehard with with the Bears, Chicago Bears, the Bears, all, the Bears. Uh, <laughs> Bears. But this was a huge thing with the Matt Nagy era. Fields or what? The Matt the Matt Nagy era, but especially with Luke Getzey, okay. who was okay. now the offensive coordinator for the Las Vegas Raiders. Okay, I'm listening. But he was with the Bears for. Two seasons, I think. Yeah, yeah, two seasons. The big problem with Luke Getze is that, and why he got fired, is because he did not tailor his playbook to his players. Mm -hmm. The Bears were not, the last two seasons before this year, were not super strong, particularly 2022. But they still, and even last season, it was looking up. He finally got a receiver. The offensive line like actually looked decent. They beat the 49ers in week one. Was that when Justin Fields went sliding in the rain? Yes, he went sliding in the rain. And I, and I get and we that. we thought he was the future of the, of the <laughs> franchise. But my point is, is that so many of the Bears offensive players that year were handicapped because the coaching staff, particularly Getze, and this is why, like, the entire offensive staff got cleared out after last season. Because mm-hmm. I followed this like crazy. Because you're a Bears fan. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I followed this so closely because Getze did not tailor his playbook to the strengths of his players. Yes. Justin Fields, and I get, and Mike Tom has been able to help him out, but Justin Fields was not really a throwing quarterback. He could run, he could throw the ball, it wasn't great. But he could run. Like a Harburg, but like, better. Like a Harburg, but better. He had more speed. Yes. He was built like a Lamar Jackson. Not as talented as Lamar Jackson, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, I wish you would have saw the look. No, 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 no. <laughs> not, not as talented as Lamar Jackson. <laughs> yeah, I get what you're saying. But he's got s- some similarities. Yes. And they tried to make him a pocket passer. They That's did. That's not his strength. And I drafted him in fantasy, and he was not good. That was a mistake. <laughs> they handicapped... DJ Moore. Cole Komet didn't get a touchdown pass, I think, until like week eight or something like that. And now Cole Komet is like one of the better tight ends in the league right now as Ben throws his hands up. I think you're that's a little far fetched, but continue. But anyway, Cole Komet's looked better this year. No, he has. But he did not look good the first couple, the first like half of the season last year. No. He was severely tied down. And that's why Getsy got fired, was because. Yeah. He wanted to stick to his script and his script only and not do anything else. Mm-hmm. And part of me feels like, and again, I know I'm speaking in severe hypotheticals here. Hypothetical. This this is all hypothetical. But I really hope that this is not the same situation with Marcus Satterfield. That he is designing his script with how he wants to run it and not adjusting to the skill set of his players. I think that's exactly what's happening. I don't. I want to believe that's not it, but I feel but, like it is what's happening. Danny, I, I, I got to be honest, and I think this is why eventually Marcus Satterfield will either a get fired or b get his play calling abilities taken away. Is that I think that is what's happening right now. What is something that Nebraska coaches have openly lamented this entire year and said it's not been good? Perimeter blocking. That is something that they have said over and over and over and over again. The perimeter blocking is not good. And you know what's crazy about that, too, is that nothing has changed. Nothing Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed, and yet they still keep trying to do all this perimeter stuff. They still keep trying to do the same things when your Mm -hmm. perimeter blocking is not there. If it's not there, then why are you doing it? I mean, that's the exact—see, this is the exact same thing. It's like, yes, they— and, and the perimeter blocking probably is better right now than it was against UTEP. I mean, I'm saying, like, they're probably better perimeter blockers right now than they were because they've been working on it. I mean, right. you have to think they're better, but it's still not good. And yet you're still trying to force stuff on the perimeter when your perimeter blocking is just not good. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is that you want this team, when they pass, to just drop back Pass, read the offense, hope your receivers are able to get open, find gaps. That's also not happening. I mean, so so what? They kind of change the script. So what can you do? You got to make your quarterback more of a threat. You got to make right now. When they go to pass the ball, it is eleven on ten. 
because Rayola is no threat to do anything at all in that backfield when it comes to running the ball. If you get Rayola to then now be a threat to maybe scramble a couple times in a game, he is now an active guy that a de- that a linebacker has to maybe spy sometimes because you're thinking, oh, he could take off out of the out of the backfield a little bit. You're now not playing eleven on ten. You're playing eleven on eleven football. See, and and, that, and I get that's not really a great analogy what I'm saying there, but no, I think but you, you, you understand what sense. I'm saying. No, it that makes sense. You have ten guys out there. But they have 11 guys to guard those 10 guys because Rayola is no threat at all. Ben, I think what we're starting to see here is, um, especially with Satterfield, and I get what you've been saying in a lot, he's wants to stick to what he has and what he has only, and he's not trying to adapt. Something's got to change. And I know I sound really Husker fanny right now. And... That I mean, it's just. Tr- I mean, it's just. It, the it's, truth. it's just the truth. I'm not even saying that because you know, I'm, I'm a fan. I want him to do all. Like, you're not. Oh, even, you're from Chicago. You like, don't even care. <laughs> I I don't. Ha- I I wouldn't say that. I'm just kidding. I'm just saying. I wouldn't say that. I don't have the same connection as some people have. Yes. But I've also seen this before yes. with with the teams I I grew up watching mm-hmm. and the teams that you know I've loved since I was a kid. And I'm seeing it now translate here, and like I said, I really want to believe that is not the case. But I'm since I brought it up now, I'm and gave it a little bit of thought. I'm starting to feel like this is the case. I think and it's most definitely the case. I, I think it's most definitely the case now that I'm actually talking about it out loud. And I apologize if I sound fanny, uh, Husker fanny. I I I feel like I am a little bit, but. From an outsider's perspective, from someone who's not working with the players, from someone who's not in constant communication with the coaches, mm-hmm. I mean, this we don't is, see practice. We no, we don't see practice. This is what it feels like when they're going out there every week and they're doing the same thing and not adjusting. Yeah, I, there there really is no two ways about it. I I think if this continues, I think there's going to start being some calls for jobs. I mean, there's already. I, I, there, I mean, there already is calls for job right but, now. But but I'm saying from from you know more respected people, not just us yapping around. Not 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 the um, thumb warriors on Twitter. And no, not just the thumb warriors on Twitter. I think there will be more people saying like there needs to be a change. There there's something's going to have to change. Yeah. I mean, if there if there isn't a change this week, and I'm not saying that this is going. I really they will get blown out this week. I have no doubt in my mind they will get blown out this week. Yeah. I don't have any confidence going into Ohio State. But for the first 10 15 minutes of the game, for the first quarter, something's got to look different. The script has, the first 15 script, whatever you're throwing out there needs to be something different than what you've been doing. Because you've seen especially since Purdue that whatever you're doing is not working. You got really lucky with Purdue because Purdue is not good and they hurt themselves they hurt themselves. That's why Nebraska was able to They get- hurt themselves more than Nebraska hurt themselves. Exactly. <laughs> you got lucky to get out of there with the win against Rutgers. I mean Rutgers offense is somehow worse than Nebraska's right now. Right. Somehow some way that was able to happen. I mean, what else is there to say? It has not looked good the last three games. And again, and I mean, let's take a step back. Nebraska is still five and two, and now that is why no one, like no one, and I'm not suggesting why there should be coaching changes or firings or anything because absolutely not midseason. No, because Nebraska is five and two right now, and they still have a very good chance. I mean, I don't want to say very good chance. They still have a chance to easily get three win, three more wins this season. And, I, and get the eight wins, and you're feeling great about your team right now. Ben, I, but Ben, what I'm saying is, if something does not change, and especially if if it doesn't happen against UCLA, I'm not saying it has to, you know, come to the forefront against Ohio State this week. But especially yeah. against UCLA, something does not change in that game. Those calls are going to be getting louder and louder and oh, louder. Danny, so th- th- this is what this is what's going to happen. We've been talking about all these things about what the offense can do better, what they can change. Is any of that going to happen? Is Rayola all of a sudden just going to start scrambling and being a little bit more of a running quarterback? Probably not. I just want the coaches to 
tailor to the players and stop sticking to what they want to do. And I, again, I, under, I just I don't think that's going to change though. I, this is just the way it is. I un, I know. I yeah. understand. <laughs> this is not the NFL. Yes, and this is the skill set. The skill set of these pl- of these players are still maturing and still growing. But this is Big Ten football. Yes, this is. You're getting paid millions of dollars as the yeah, head coach. It, yes, and the players are getting paid pretty well too mm-hmm. for for college kids. Mm-hmm. This is the second best conference in college football. Yeah, this this is as close as for some of these guys. This is as close to the league as they're going to get. Mm-hmm. They are playing NFL caliber talent for the most part. They, yeah. They 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 will be playing NFL caliber talent for the most part on for, Saturday. They will. Oh, oh yeah, for I don't know maybe thirty three percent of the season, forty percent of the season. They will mm-hmm. be playing teams with NFL caliber talent, good teams. Mm-hmm. So I think that the 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 comparison is is viable. I think it makes sense. No, it is. And Danny, we how how long we've been going. Really long time on this. And remember when we said we were going to start with my position grades? We never even got into that. Oh, I just well, love how this show goes. It's amazing. We're not going to get to it today, but I but just want to leave it. Can I? What? Go ahead. You know, go, I want to leave. I want to leave it with this: is that what, what? What? What's actually going to probably happen? Nothing's probably going to change on offense. I don't think there's going to be this complete just like change in the play calling, and the offense is all of a sudden going to figure it out. I don't think that's going to happen. Marcus Satterfield is who he is. This offense is what it is. Now, do I think that Harburg might get a couple more touches in the game? Probably. But I don't think it's going to be enough to make this running game all of a sudden be good enough. Are the wide receivers going to all of a sudden just start getting open? Probably not. So what's going to happen? They're probably going to lose against Ohio State. I think that's a pretty much a given. The next game against UCLA is so huge. Because if you lo- if Nebraska loses against UCLA, I I don't even want to know what Husker Twitter is going to be like. I don't even want to know what the fans are going to be saying, because it's going to be ugly. Because if they lose to UCLA, the, the 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 flag is all the way at the top of the pole. The red flag that it's we starting that, to come the, off. It's starting, the, the, to, starting the, to fly it's so, off. It's so high up, <laughs> so high up that it's going to be flying off. Because Nebraska then after Ohio State is probably going to be five and three. And if you lose the UCLA, you're then five and four, and you have USC, Wisconsin, Iowa. None spells, of those again. It spells trouble. This spells very similarly to how last year went, but with an easier schedule. You had an easier schedule this year than you did last year. Mm-hmm. And yet, there's a very good chance you get the same amount of wins with a better roster this year than you had last year. That is when stuff is going to start spelling trouble. If Nebraska plays Ohio State decent, don't lose fifty six to seven. They lose like I don't know forty two to fourteen or something, and it's just like okay, it was I don't know. I mean, you get what I'm trying to say. Ohio right. State's not a. They don't look completely dysfunctional against Ohio State. They go and beat UCLA, and then they win one of the last three. They're then seven and five, and no one's calling for anyone's jobs right now. The big game is UCLA. That is the big game. What, and I, I don't mean to cut you off. What no, you're I'm, good. I am most upset about with this, and again, I apologize if I am sounding very fan-like, but they should not have looked this bad out of a bye week. No, this and was, we didn't even talk about that. We didn't even get to that. And it's There's a, so much to get to. It's a, <laughs> I know. There's a lot to get to after this. It's a shame that we didn't. So I'll try and make this as brief as I can because we have been going for a while. It is, it, it, it's a stain on the program. It's a stain on the program. For what Mark, for, oh, God, I got Marcus Satterfield in my head right now. Well, for what Matt Rule is trying you to build PTSD. here. PTSD. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> for what Matt Rule is trying to build here, this is a stain on his legacy. It's a stain. It's a stain on. It's a stain on him. Ben, you're rolling it, your eyes. It, it could be. You're, I'll you're say rolling, it could be. You're rolling your eyes. It at, could be. You're rolling your eyes at me. And I think this, and I think you you might have a point when disagreeing with me, but I think that if things do not at least look a little bit better this week, oh yeah, I know that they are not the the chances of them winning this week are like in outer space. They're like, twenty two point underdogs. It's not gonna happen. Let's get real here. It's not gonna happen. 
All they got to do is just look a little bit more com- competent and be like, all right, I might feel a little bit better. Maybe. I, I don't know. Danny, I, was, I think I think you can be completely right. If Nebraska only gets like five or six wins this season, we're looking at that Indiana game and we're saying this is where the season went like, wrong. I just want to know what was going on during that bye week. Because when we were talking last week about this game, I did not think that it was outlandish to think that they wouldn't win. Mm-hmm. But at least be competitive and take it down towards the end of the game. No, yeah. You're completely this, right. This game was over halfway through the second quarter. It might have mm-hmm. only the score might have only read twenty one to seven, but it was over the moment Indiana scored that third touchdown. I mean, I, you want to know the moment when I said it was over? When Jacory Barney went out at the one yard line on the kickoff. <laughs> like this, that this, that and that this, was the play. That you, I was like, you knew that it was, you knew that it was trouble as soon as Dowdell fumbled on fourth down. You didn't think it was going to be fifty-six to seven trouble, but you thought, okay, Nebraska's not winning this game. I did not think Nebraska was going to win. I did not expect it to be this bad. So yeah. I, my huge issue with this is, you should not be getting blown out of a bye week. No. So what the heck was going on during that bye week? And, and that's, what were what were you doing to prepare for this? Because whatever you did, you had two weeks. Mm-hmm. Get ready for this team whose offense was ridiculously good. They they blew everybody out. Mm-hmm. This was a team that should not have blown you out this badly. No. And embarrass you in front of your entire fan base on national television like this. Hey, at least, in, at least it wasn't at, at in le- Lincoln. They are so grateful it did not happen in Lincoln and did yeah. not happen in Lincoln Memorial Stadium. Now, they, they should be so grateful that this happened on the road and it was not like the Michigan game last year. Now, Danny, I agree with you that this game could completely be a huge stain on Matt Rule's legacy. It com- it completely can be. And that was always my thought. That After that game happened, that was all I could think about. But you still have to take a step back and think Nebraska is 5-2. and two. They still have a good chance to get to eight wins. And if and what's to say in the outlandish thing that they do win eight games this year? Are we thinking about that Indiana game? I'm still going to be thinking about it. I, I, I got to be honest. We're still going to remember it, but we're not going to be thinking about it at all like we are right now. Now, if Nebraska only has five or six wins, even if they get the six wins and get a bowl game, you are still very disappointed with how this game, with how this but, season went. You know what's going to be a huge game for me now, looking at the rest of the schedule? Mm-hmm. Put you know UCLA aside. It's going to be USC. And I want to explain why I think USC is going to be a big game. That's explain. It. <laughs> it's going to be after Nebraska's second bye of the season. <laughs> that means they're going to lose. <laughs> what are they uh, going to learn from this? Because whatever they did during that bye week. I don't know clearly did not work. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to know what they did because whatever it did did not work. (laughs) I hope that for the sake of everyone's jobs in that building, that they figure something out going into that week. They don't don't even have to win the game. It would be great if they win the game. But if they go out and they put up a clunker like this, they get embarrassed again in a fashion like this to a USC team that's been up and down this year, what, excuse me, what does that say about this coaching staff? Um, I, mean, I don't, I, I don't even put it on the players at that point. I put that solely on the coaches. That if, if they get blown out by USC on the road after a bye week in a fashion like this where they're making stupid mistakes – I don't even put any of that on the players. That is all on the coaches. No, I agree. All and on I mean, the coaches. At the not end the of the day, people want to say players go out there and they're the ones that actually play. They have to go and do it. But I mean, it was clear on Saturday that Matt Rule got outcoached. It was clear. Because he was this, outcoached from the opening kickoff. Because and and this is why, because I mean, I don't want to say it was just Indiana, because this is a good Indiana team. Don't get me wrong. But let's be honest, <coughs> it is just Indiana. I mean, Indiana, a, a team that has never had any kind of success in the history of its program. I mean, not, literally have never had a successful program. in Since, like, the 1940s, they have not had a good program. This is the be- This is probably the best team they've had since the 1940s. I mean, and that's, that's not even outlandish to say at all. No. This is in Indiana. This is in Ohio State. 
This isn't Michigan. This isn't Penn State. This is Indiana. Now, I don't want to say it was just Indiana because this was a good Indiana team. But this, again, shows how why can a team like Indiana go and do this? They're 7-0, ranked number 13. But Nebraska, with all the facilities you have, all the fans you have, the tradition you have. That was the Indiana's first sellout have, in like a decade. And the NIL. I mean, Nebraska has everything better than Indiana. There is literally not a thing that Indiana has that's better than here in Nebraska. Literally, there is literally this, not something that's better. This athletic department is one of the few in the country that can support itself. They don't take anything from student tuition. They don't take anything from the government. It is self-standing. They get everything from the fans and the donors. Yeah. They don't take any they don't take anything from the university itself. It runs on its own. Mm-hmm. And the fact that And it runs very well on its own. It runs very well on it runs very well on its own. And the fact that this athletic department cannot put together a good football program still with everything that you've got. I I mean I I don't even know where to start with it. I mean it and it's not the fact that they like okay, they're 5 and 2. It's the fact that a school like Indiana can just come in. Literally last year they were one and eleven. Ben, am I am I overreacting with this? No, you're not. <laughs> See, Danny, Indiana was one and eleven last year. One and eleven, and they are now seven and zero, ranked number thirteen in the country, and they just beat you fifty six to seven. This is Matt Rule's second year, and I get it's only a second year, but still, it is Matt Rule's second year. This is you supposed to be his five, turnaround year. You got a five-star quarterback in Dylan Rayola. You have all this NIL money. Now, it's not Ohio State NIL money. See, the difference between getting blown out by Ohio State in Indiana is that, well, Ohio State, this is Ohio State. They have better recruits. They have more NIL money. They just, I mean, everything about them right now is just better. But this is Indiana we're talking about. There is literally not one thing that Indiana has that's better than yours. You have a better training facility, you have better NIL, you have better fans, you have better stadium, you have better everything, better tradition, better history. You have literally nothing that Indiana could say that's better than your program. And Kurt Signetti comes in, brings in a 13 guys from James Madison or what, however, whatever the number is, and he went and beat the living crap out of your team. Now that, it, it's, it's and, and this is the word when the word pathetic comes out. It was it was a pathetic showing, and it just shows how, and it leaves fans questioning why can they do it and Nebraska can't. Now Nebraska chose a guy that was in the NFL, so he couldn't bring guys over from his former school. Now that's a different conversation of what kind of coach do you want to hire when you're looking for the direction of your program? Do you want to hire a guy that can bring over some guys and bring you immediate success? Or are you going to hire somebody that's going to try to build it from the ground up, and which is probably going to take some more time? I mean that's just. Kind of that's a whole different conversation we don't have time for, but still it just leaves you questioning Matt Rose program. But again, they're five and two, still have a chance to still get eight wins, and and I mean this Indiana loss doesn't hurt as much because if Nebraska gets eight wins, have a chance to win that bowl game, they get nine wins. I mean Husker fans are ecstatic. I still think, and while if we ask the, if I'm asked the same question in January after the or yeah. End of January when the football season's over, I still think that this is a game that we still look back on. At least for me, this is still a game that we look back on. Oh, we most definitely look back. We on. will, no matter what. If this is a team that goes out and wins nine games, great. Nine, nine and five, great. Congratulations, you won or eight and five, whatever. I mean, this it is. is the worst loss of the eight, Matt Royer. Eight, yes, it is. Eight and five, nine and four, what, whatever it is. Great. Cong- congratulations, you won nine games. This mm-hmm. is still a game that we're going to go. And look back on, and I continue to harp on it because there is, again, I am going to sound like a broken record. I like broken records, but there is no reason that they should have that they looked that bad. Yeah, there's coming no out of a bye week, yeah. out of a bye week. Yes, no, it Danny, makes I, no sense. I completely get it. It's pathetic. Again. It's disgraceful, and it's. It's a damnation on the coaches. <laughs> it, it is. You are like, sounding like a Husker fan right now. I, I know. love that. I love that. No, because no, it, it, I, 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 I'm saying this because it's bonkers that this happened out of a bye week. It just bonkers. It is bonkers. <laughs> I've been using the word bonkers a lot lately. <sighs> but it's bonkers that this happened out of a bye week because you had two weeks. No, to I get, get ready it. for this. Two weeks. 
No, yeah, even Matt Rule said he got outcoached. I mean, there, there's no denying he got outcoached. Now, do we think Matt Rule's a bad coach? No, no, I Mm-mm. don't. I don't nope. think he's a bad coach. I'm not calling for his job. No one, no one. And if you are calling for his job, you're very short sighted because he. I mean, the way he's trying to build this team is it's going to be slower. But still, I mean, the the fact is is that I mean, Nebraska is still five and two, but I mean, you still just. I mean, Matt Rule in the history of his coaching has not. I mean, he he's never beat a ranked team as a college coach. I don't think. Nope. I mean, again, this this you never you, you, never has. you start to question how what is the ceiling of a Matt Rule program? He talks about being a national champ, like trying to build this into a national championship contending team. That's all great. That's words, but you've never you've never really shown that you could do it. And then also another thing that was very hard to hear was Matt Rule saying. We didn't expect this. I mean, I, I, it, it makes you question: How did you not see this coming? Like, I, I don't get how you can't. And that was that was one of the big things about why I'm getting so hyped up and and talking like this about yeah. bye week. How, if you didn't expect this coming, then what did you do during that bye week? What did you do to get ready for this? I mean, yeah, I mean, I because they looked I, lost that whole time. I'm not saying that he should have been like, oh man, we're gonna lose fifty six to seven. That's not at all what we're saying. I'm just saying there had to have been some kind of a sign that this was gonna happen. I mean, I mean, you don't just lose, you don't just head into a game thinking that everything is great, and then you lose fifty six to seven. I mean, that's just not, that's just not how think, that's just not how football works. I mean, I gotta be honest. I mean, he talks about how it's X's and O's. There was clearly something in the X's and O's that made you lose 56-7. to seven. Now, you you say you want to take the, the mental part of it. He's like, if you're supposed, I mean, Matt Rule said in, in, on Monday, he's like, if you're supposed to be in the B gap, just be in the B gap. Why are you in the A gap? He says stuff like that. And he says it's just football. But it's not just football. And if it is just football, then you should have saw this coming. Because it's like, there's no reason you should have not, like, if it is all just football, then you should have saw this coming. You should have saw that they were gonna that they were that much better than you. I mean, to be honest, I, I just I'm not saying you should have been like knowing that they were gonna lose this bad, but like he had to have known something was off. There just had to have been something that was off. There's no way the beginning of that game felt the same as the beginning of the Purdue game or the beginning of the Rutgers game. There's just no way that it that it was the same. There's no way. Well, that we, we've, we've had quite the rants today. No, and, and um, we didn't even get to talk about Marcus Satterfield's comments today. Because he, I mean, have you seen Twitter? Oh, goodness. Marcus Satterfield, I mean, do we have time real quick? I we've just gone wanna, way over what we usually do, we, but we let's, 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 let's spend three minutes on it. Because let's go real quickly. Marcus it. Satterfield said, I mean, he, he made some alarming um I was very concerned comments. when I saw because and this, and this is why people, there are Husker fans that are calling for Marcus Satterfield's job right now. And he he didn't look great today. I mean, he didn't look great yesterday, excuse me, at the podium, because he said that Nebraska um the yards per play. The, the yards per play thing. But that wasn't even the thing that got me the most because I mean he really? didn't, he, he didn't know oh. the goal. He's like, well, was was he's like, what's even leads the nation, or whatever. I mean, that's kind of just like, okay, you're the offensive coordinator, you should probably know how many yards per play you're shooting for? Shows he's not prepared. I mean, I mean that. that I mean, it really. Does. I think he was though caught off guard by the question. It was he the did ve- look a little cut off. It guard. was the very. La- I mean, he the, the, like they literally were like he was about to walk off the podium, and then someone asked that. So I think he was caught off uh, caught off guard a little bit, but he still said what he said. But the most damning thing that he said was that, um, was that he needs to commit to the run game more, and I'm like. That was your 19th game as an offensive coordinator. Why, why, why are we still having discussions of not committing to the run game more? I mean, that, that that's more that's more where I'm coming from because it's just like, I mean, at this point, why why are we still having conversations about you needing to commit to the run game more? I mean, this I mean, it's just not hard. If you want to run the ball 20 times, run the ball 20 times. I mean, if if that's what you mean. I mean, now I get you don't want to just be like, oh, we have to run the ball here because we have to commit to the run game. So even though we know that they're Blitzing, we're not going to be able to run anything. We still got to run it. It's not that. It's still like, if you have a philosophy, go through with it. Don't say you need to do something, and then you don't do it during the game. Because because all beginning of the year, Matt Rule and Satterfield both said we need to get a, we need to be a run first team, and they haven't done that this year. Nope. They haven't done that this year, and they're still and they're still saying it, and it's all just words. 
And I think that's why Husker fans get upset because everything is just words and there's no action being put into it. And that's the frustrating part for fans. Thank you for that rant, Ben. We, You're welcome, we, Danny. We've done a lot of ranting. Um, we talked a little, had a little fan talk today, but it was it came from a place of it, it came from a place of football people just not doing football things, and it they they got exposed for it, and. I personally got passionate about it and started. You did. Started you going, sounded like a Husker fan, Danny. I, I, I'm, cr- I, I'm proud of you right <laughs> now. I'm proud of you. I started. Go- well, I started going on a tangent because this is not how football teams should no. should operate. Remember and, when I said I think it was the first episode of Scarlet Fever? I said it's not bad luck. It's just bad football. I said. I mean, everyone thinks that Nebraska's like cursed. They're never going to be good again. It's not that. It's just bad football. Saturday was just bad football. It's just bad football. And and that's why I got the way that I was because this is a team that has proven over and over again that they cannot solve the incompetency problem. And Saturday we saw some incompetency. They we did, but I mean I, I'm still it's still crazy how everyone is looking at this as a sky falling thing because it it is oh, a little I, crazy. I, I don't think that the sky is falling. I think that it's it's approaching sky falling. I think it's very close. I think I think we're we're on uh, we're we're ascending to that spot. I think that something's going to have to change on Saturday, no matter what the outcome is. Something is going to have to change against Ohio State. I I don't think this Ohio State game is going to show much. I got to be honest. I, I, just, I don't. Think I want to show. I much. just want to see one thing. One thing be different than what it was this week. Just don't get blown out this bad. Don't look like you are playing pee wee football. The game you're circling is UCLA right now. I'm telling you. Matt Rule says you got to go 1 0 every season, but I know, and they know, the UCLA game is the most gettable game. You have that at home. They're not that great of a team. That's the game that they're circling, saying this is the most gettable game. And if you don't get that game, your players are now, I mean, you, you, like, and Matt Rule said in his press conference, the thing he's had, the, the hardest thing he's had to deal with this year is that, is that mindset of here we go again. That mindset's going to be full effect if they lose to oh, UCLA. Oh, it, it will be everywhere. It's going to be in full effect on the outside noise from fans to your players in your locker room. And They're for me. All <laughs> gonna, and you and me. We're all going to be thinking, here we go again. And that's on Matt Rule to get rid of that narrative. Here we go, Jim. Here we go, Tony. All right, Danny. We need to end this so we so this doesn't go two hours. <laughs> well, no, we, thanks, Danny. That, no, had, that was good. We've had some very good conversation today. It was good. I that's why we had to go. I mean, there was a lot to talk about. We showed some additional emotion that we usually don't show because... <laughs> you did. <laughs> especially for me, because this is... You know, I, I have... I've dealt with bad fo- bad football a lot. You know? I and mean, you're a Bears fan and a Husker fan. Right it's now, so. I do have the Husker fan in me. I try and put it aside as much as I can, and I let it come it's out. It's put aside right now for me. I I let it come out a little bit just because, um, especially for the players. Like I care about the, the players and their well being mm-hmm. and want them to do well. Yeah. And, and it annoys me to see that the coaches are not playing to their strengths. And I hopefully something changes. I don't know if it will. Hopefully something changes. I just. I mean, we'll as, see. as as someone who is close in age to a lot of these players, I feel for them. Mm-hmm. And as someone who's played sports, I feel for them. Like I, I, I hope that you know they're hearing the outside noise. I know they are definitely hearing the outside noise, and I hope that they're they're channeling it into making themselves better. And you know, I want to support them as much as like they're everyone needs they, to support them. Yeah. Ben and I are both students here. All these players are students here. We're, we want to support our peers as best as they can, and from our lens, this does not feel like that their coaches are supporting them in the way that they need to be supported on the field. And I mean, and, and I mean, the coaches have been saying that. I mean, there's not a single coach on the Husker staff that have been blaming the players. I don't feel like. I mean, they all say it's their fault. Yes. And, and, and how many times? It and has my been, thing it has is how many fault. how many times can they say that though until something happens? Exactly. Well, I hope you had fun with this episode. I hope I, I did, Danny. I hope that all of you enjoyed some of our rants and got to an hear extra some, long show. Today. An, ex, an extra long show. Um, it, it was overdue. I hope that next week's 
it isn't as emotional as this is and doesn't get it as, you know, it doesn't go as long. That'd be nice. <laughs> Bro, but I, I'm there, we didn't even get to everything I wanted to talk no. about. No. So. There, there was a lot to get to. We need another this show this week, Danny. <laughs> Give me a Friday show. We, we might do a bonus show this week, so. Stay tuned. With, with that said, you can read all of our football coverage at dailynebrassin.com. Ben's position grades are there. Yeah, read there's, my position grades since we didn't get to them. There's, there's a couple other <laughs> things there that you can take a look at. There's always football coverage all week, but it's this what this was a much needed therapy session. I feel like for some of the husband not, fans that live, not that therapy listen. for me. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just calling it as it is right now. I don't feel any less of anything oh, you poor right thing. now than I did. The beginning. <laughs> Do you feel better? I, I feel, mean, I feel the exact same. I, I aired out some frustrations. Okay. I'll put it that way. That's and good, and I hope I'm glad you feel better right now. <laughs> Some frustrations will air it out. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching wherever you, you have been listening or watching to Scarlet Fever. We appreciate all of the love and attention that you've given us as we've been getting this back off the ground. Yep. Thank you for supporting students in the media. It helps Ooh. us a whole heck of a lot. Thank you, Ben, for stopping thank you, by. Man. Thank you for spending some extra time. Extra, extra. Some, some extra, extra time. Thank you for listening. We will see you next time on Scarlet Fever. Have a great day, everybody.